I'm doing well, man. I'm do You're looking great. You're looking great. <laughs> Is it cold out there? No, actually, we just hit summer, so it's all good. Okay. So hold, hold, hold on a minute. Give yeah, me a sure. minute. I'm so, so what's going on? It's all good, baby. I mean, thank you ever so much for for coming on the show. Um, I I see you got the seven five. Um, I got mine too. Oh yeah. I got the big chocho right here with me. I see. See, I got the new lots. I got the new lots. That's that's what I'm rolling with right now. I so, love the new lots. New lots are awesome. Fantastic. You know, very smooth. Very very smooth. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's this. I, I I I don't know if you've if you've done anything in the UK before with regards to podcasting or anything like that. Have, is, am I am I your am I your debut? I don't hear you well. Hold, hold on a minute. Okay, no um, problem. Hold on. Se le puede subir más volumen eh, localmente eh, a la computadora que estoy grabando. Can you hear me now? Hold on, give me a minute. Cool. I'm trying to raise the volume on this stuff. No problem. All right, let's just try to do it like that then. Okay. All right, so say that again, please. Sorry. Um. No, 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 that's cool. That's cool. No problem at all. I was just saying, I mean, is this your first kind of UK interview have you ever done anything in the uk before no 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 not at all wow so i i'm a i, I feel honored i feel honored to be in your presence right now mr diaz it's, it's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> okay I'm, I'm glad you feel that way well you know i mean hey at the end of the day i saw the seven five um documentary or as they call it now precinct seven five and um you you make you make a hell of an entrance, man. You make a hell of an entrance. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> so what's going on for you right now? I see you. You're in the you're in the cigar business. Well, I'm in. The, I'm in. The, I, I was in the cigar business a long, long time ago. Not in the business, but my 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 uh, grandparents. Uh, you know, my grandfather. Uh, he used to own a farm mm -hmm. in the uh, up in the mountains, right in the north far of the of the country. And he grows tobacco leaves. I see. And so when I was a kid, I used to run around in a horse, you know, uh, in the farm. Mm -hmm. And I got, I'm familiar with that. Right, right, right. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I went to school in New York City because uh, they took me out there when I was a kid. Right. And I grew up out there. So I forgot all about this stuff in Dominican, all this, you know, I was too, 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 too of a baby to, you know, really know about this stuff. Right. But then when I came back, uh, uh, like, came back in 1988, and, mm -hmm. and I was uh, around uh, my, my grandparents, you know, business, uh, yeah. the farm. Uh, you, actually, they don't, they don't make cigars. They never make cigars. What they did was they grow the leaves and they sell it to the, to the fabrics. That's Absolutely. what they do. So um, I wasn't familiar with the, with the fact of, of, of making cigars. You know? Okay. I just the land and you know uh, running around with the Duncans you know <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but anyway um, the thing is that that um, ho ho hold on a minute yeah. maybe now Yes sir. yes, sir. You're good? <laughs> okay, well, anyway, so the thing is that now uh, after I came out from the States, you mm -hmm. know, uh, they don't want me there no more, but it's all right. Yes. And um, uh, I came back and I, I met with a couple of friends uh, that they know my family. Uh, yep. They know my family for over 70, 80 years already, you know. I wasn't even born. Right, right. Uh, so, uh, and they came, they approached me and they, they asked me if they, I was pretty much interested in, in, 
bringing out a cigar with, the, with my name on it. I said, fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, they wanted only my name on it. Right. And, uh, and I said, it would, be good, it would be a good idea if we, if we use the name 75. Mm-hmm. I mean, not, not, not as uh, most of my, uh, some of Twitter's followers been saying that, uh, uh, or the newspaper in New York City, the New York Post says that, that I name it after the 75 precincts. But it's not like that at all. Okay. So I named is, it after after the um, seven five documentary. Right. Right. You know, because, uh, it's a, it was a great idea from Tiller Rosser, mm-hmm. the uh, you know the producer. He's a uh, he's a great guy. We now we're good friends, mm-hmm. and uh, so I figured it's a good name, and we used it. You know, I I, I registered it yep. worldwide. Yep. It's fine now, and I can you know. You said any time I want. It had nothing to do with the police prison. I, police prisons in New York, they have a number. They don't have a name. That's right. That's right. You know that's what right. I mean? so, um, but, you know, and, 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 and we went along to make the cigar. And these guys are very happy with the product. I, I tell you, it's a great product. It's, it's a fantastic smoke, man. Um, you know, like I say, <laughs> you give Cohiba a run for their money, for real. <laughs> well... We're working on something very good. We'll, we'll see what happens. So, it takes a little bit of time. It's not easy. It's not an easy business. It's very hard business. Well, especially when it's yeah. as saturated as it is. Do you know what I mean? You know, like, because, um, you know, d- developing a new product, especially like a cigar, because people know, like, Monte Cristo, uh, Cohiba, you know, all of those guys. And they, always, and, and they always associate cigars with Cuba. You don't really, see, you don't really hear too much about the Dominican Republic too much. Well, Dominican Republic produces now the, one of the best cigars in the world. Uh, we use uh, Cuban seeds, you know, mm-hmm. uh, use several Honduran seeds. We, in, the, in the cigar business, I don't think there's a competition. There, there's always some, some sort of association between all tobacco eras, which right. is uh, people that who, who, who make the cigars. Yeah. They now they don't they don't go uh, trying to make competition with nobody. They just you know everyone they own, they make their own they, they mind their own business. Right, you know right. they, they do what they gotta do. They do what they do. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I guess really that kind of traverse. You know, we kind of we can kind of bring it around, if you will. You know, we've got a successful uh, a, a successful cigar business on the back of the documentary. And um, for those of you who are listening right now, who might not have, um, who who may have not yet seen the documentary, I highly recommend it. Go check it out. It's a fan. <laughs> I mean, it, it it's it's mad. It's craziness. It's craziness. What was going on back then? You know, it's. I mean, just um, just the sheer. Uh, you know the, the the pace the action um i mean it you know and this is real life this wasn't scripted this this was as it was going on right well um i i didn't know it was going to have the impact that it had mm-hmm. uh didn't know at all uh i just i, I wasn't uh, i i i've been i've been called in the past from a lot of producers to to come out with a movie or whatever Mm-hmm. And uh, and the only person that I really really liked was Tiller Rosser because I had a, a private conversation with him before he started filming, mm-hmm. and uh, he convinced me. I think he's an honest guy. He yep. comes through with his work. Mm-hmm. So here we are. We got a documentary pretty soon. Pretty much, I think it's going to be a movie. I'm not sure, but oh, uh, had a lot of people calling me about it. I, but I. In all reality, I really the only person that I think I can trust for that it will be Tilly Ross because you know how it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, loyalty is everything. I mean, if there's anything that we can garner from the documentary is, in, and if there's one thing that we can kind of say about it, is loyalty, right? You know, I mean, we'll we'll get we'll get onto the nitty gritty in a minute, but loyalty is key to um to the Seven Five documentary, and. Yep. Um, and that, I guess, really kind of brings us down to how you and I got together, which was through um, through the man himself, Mike Dowd, um, who is uh, one of the, I'd say, probably the, the, the face, one of the faces of the 7-5 documentary, um, or as he was known back then, 
New York police officer Mike Dowd? Uh, yeah, Let's pretty see. much. So I mean, so I, the, the 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 thing for me was like, you know, when 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 we when we have our children, you know, we we kind of, you know, we we see them grow and we think to ourselves like. What, what are you what, what do you want to do when you grow up and children usually say I want to be an astronaut I want to be a doctor I want to be this I want to be that when when you were a child growing up did you ever kind of I mean you you said you had experiences on like tobacco plantations that your family had but did you ever really I mean how how does that kind of transfer from Adam the child on his grandparents you know tobacco finger to becoming Adam Diaz, the cocaine distributor in New York. <laughs> How does that happen? That is so funny, but it's cool. I, I like you. <laughs> uh, well, th to be honest with you, uh, back in those days when I was a kid in the Dominican mm -hmm. Republic, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, uh, cocaine and drugs, none of that shit. You would never, you, you, first of all, you would not see that point. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't even hear people in the in the neighborhood talking about stuff like that. It was right. not part of the vocabulary. Gotcha. Uh, there was no such thing as drugs. Uh, and uh, um, but when I was transferred to New York City, mm -hmm. I was a kid still, and um, the whole world changed. I mean, when I got to New York City, I got to New York City, um, and. Uh, I got to a place called Washington Heights. Right. It's inspected with drugs. Mm -hmm. A lot of fucking drugs. Yep. Heatmen's all over, you know? We mm -hmm. call it, here in Dominican, we call it Sicario. Sicario, yeah. Yeah. People that, they have no respect for human life. They'll kill you in a heartbeat, no problem. Right. They'll kill cops, no problem. Mm -hmm. So, the thing is that, when I got to New York City, um, there was nothing but drugs, prostitutes, uh, burning buildings all over. Just like the show in the documentary. They, yeah. I mean, they did a good job. Tila Russell did a good job because it was just like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, in order for me to get from my house, from my apartment, it was it was the building 539 West, 163rd Street. Mm -hmm. It was between Broadway and Nicholas Avenue. And um, to get there all the way to my high, to my junior high school. I actually had to go through at least eight blocks and all buildings were burned. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it was the, like the, right after the uh, Martin Luther King era, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. all the fucking buildings burned out. Mm -hmm. So all you see in this building was people selling drugs, prostitutes, uh, burning cars. They steal the cars and they take the, the auto parts and then they leave the whole fucking junk there and they burn it so cops don't, don't do a trace or whatever the fuck mm -hmm. they were doing. So that's what I grew up looking at, right. you know what I mean? So uh, then from Washington Heights, uh, I used to be in a, in a baseball team called uh, the Black Panthers from Riverside. Hey. The, the guy who was training us, well, his name was Mike. Mm -hmm. He was a tall black guy, he used to be a, a, a baseball player. Mm -hmm. And he was really good with kids and he, I was first base. And he tried to really help the kids in the area to become better person and stuff, but yeah. it didn't work. Well, the thing is that from there, my mother moved uh, to uh, South Bronx. Mm -hmm. oh, so yeah. imagine from fucking Washington Heights, which is inspected with drugs, Dominicans, all Dominicans and Puerto Ricans. You, I mean, you have St. Nicholas Avenue right here, Fudo. It, it was like Harlem. Yeah. Right. On the east side, then you have the west side, which you have the Dominicans and the Puerto Ricans. So, hello, you know, gotcha. Italians were not longer around. Italians left to the to the Bronx, to uh, Valentine's Avenue, the Bronx and stuff, Yankees yep. and stuff. No more Italians in the area. Anyway, so from there, my mother moved to the Bronx, South Bronx, which was Tremont Avenue and uh, uh, Tremont and Cedar. That's right in front of the Roberto Clemente Park. Okay. It's nothing but blacks in that area. Okay. I mean, I have, to, I have no problem with black people at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. But it, 
the worst, like drug dealers, hookers, shit like that. Okay. You know what I mean? Right. So then uh, Puerto Ricans that came from uh, the Vietnam War and they were on drugs because of that war and stuff. Smack. Yeah, yeah. I used to roller skate in that area. I used to go to, uh, I remember, um, Macomb's 82 Junior High School mm -hmm. on University Avenue. And also in that area, you had to walk like, I had to walk like, practically like 25 blocks, all burning buildings too. Right, right. So like, again, nothing but drugs. It's like a war zone. Yeah, that's when I really got started to see uh, people smoking marijuana, you know, because in Washington Heights, there's, there was more police present. Okay. So they'll do things in the hiding, you know? Yeah. Uh, Underground. But in the Bronx, in the Bronx was like, like it was legal. Mm -hmm. Like you see anybody with a fucking weed, weed cigar, you know? <laughs> and they smoke weed right in front of you, in front of your kids in the street. Don't matter. They don't give a shit. Right, right. So it was like something normal for me to see, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was like, welcome to the new world. Gotcha. So then after that, uh, I finished high school there, uh, junior high school. Mm -hmm. then, then my mother moved to Harlem. Oh, wow. Okay. 119 in St. Nicholas. I mean, I had to walk from 125th Street, where the, the A train stopped, all the way to 119 in St. Nicholas. I had two sisters that were gorgeous. When they were young, you know, blue mm -hmm. eyes, tall, beautiful, blonde. Imagine those two young girls walking in Harlem in the middle of the night, coming from school and stuff. So it was like, I asked my mother, what the hell are you doing? I mean, but well, it is what it is. So we moved there and then, then I started going to, uh, to see a, a guy who was uh, actually from my hometown in Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father raised him, I remember, because he didn't have any father or anything. But he ended up in New York. Right. But when he came to New York, he was already an adult. Gotcha. And uh, he was a big drug dealer. All right. Okay. His name was uh, Rafael, but they call him Truki. Okay. Guys with a balls this size. This guy with you no know, fear in this guy's eyes. And uh, well, as a matter of fact, he used to go in the roof of the fucking buildings with a 30-30 with a fucking telescope and shoot a fucking uh, light poles, like the, the lights uh, in the street, uh -huh. just to have a fucking crazy guy. <laughs> well, actually, he got arrested by the feds back then in mm -hmm. the early, early 80s. Uh, he got arrested by the feds. He did time for that. Right, right. They went into his apartment and they found all kinds of fucking weapons in there. He lost weapons. So anyway, uh, I started selling drugs to him. Okay. He teach me. Like, like, back in those days, uh, it was like the customer used to come to your house, to your apartment. You had to open the door for them. You, have a, you had a guy in front of the building. Make sure nobody funny comes in. Yep. Then when they come into your apartment, you put them against the wall. Just like if you're a fucking cop. Yeah, yeah. And you search him. Make sure he doesn't have a gun. Mm -hmm. Then you bring him through the hallway, set him, sit him down in the office, and then you ask him, what do you want? Right. And then you have the fucking scale there, mm -hmm. pure cocaine. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then you ask the guy, what do you want? You want an ounce? You want a half an ounce? You want a kilo? What do you want? So the guy said, yeah, I want a half an ounce. Okay, so you scale this shit right in front of him and give it him. Right. So imagine, I'm not fucking 15 years old and I'm doing that already. Wow. How much were you making at 15 years old? Money? Yeah. Pennies. Right, okay. Because when you're that age, you just live the, the moment. Right. And, and people like that, what they do, they use you. You know what I mean? Right. They give you money for sneakers. They give you money, shitty money. Okay. But you don't really look at it out like that. But, but you got to take, uh, take under account that at the same time, I'm going to a trade school to learn uh, how, to be, uh, how to become an, an electrician. Okay. Because my father was pretty much uh, uh, like, like my father was very concerned about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. so yeah. My father sent me to that school and I started to, go, uh, to become an electrician, which I did. I became an electrician. I worked a lot of years as an electrician. Okay. But at the same time, I was living that life too. Right, oh, right. You know? so there's two Adam. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, by the way, I had a, I had a, a uh, my boss, his name was Richard Thomas. Mm-hmm. Italian guy. 
Okay. And, uh, and his business partner, his name was Arning Neighbor, a, a guy from uh, an Arab guy. He was a he was a Navy uh, Navy veteran. Okay. And and uh, they loved me. They loved me. And and I remember one time when the, when the movie from Al Pacino came out, uh, Scarface. He says, Adam. Uh, uh, you, I know you're Dominican. If you ever fucking sell drugs, I'll fucking kill you. Oh, I shit. <laughs> if only they knew. <laughs> yeah, because they had a, you know, they were like, you come to work, but you have a nice car, and then you have nice clothes. What the fuck is going on? You know? Right, 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 right. But, but they love me to death. They, they really want to keep me in the right track. Uh huh. Uh huh. Anyway, so um, so I started working with Rookie and um, started selling the drugs. But then I left Rookie. And then I left drugs at all. I mean, I left drugs. Okay. I, I wasn't fucking with drugs no more. And I started working uh, electricity in the city for a cousin of mine who has an electrical company, Palma. Yeah. Same last name, Palma <laughs> uh, Electrical Corporation. They're one of the biggest in Miami, by the way, right now. Okay. And, um, the thing is that then I, I, got, I got involved with this girl, with this woman, mm -hmm. and she got pregnant. So there you go. I'm fuck. I need money for the rent. I need, you know, you I left my house. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, I left my house. I I couldn't be with my mother's house, and uh, so then I started fucking around with the drugs again. So I end up, I end up in the Lower East Side. You know what the Lower East Side was back then? Go on. Like the fucking. If you go by, if you go in the computer and 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 and, and Google and you check it out, uh, 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 Lower East Side back in the '80s. Mm -hmm. It's a war zone. Wow, really? Yeah, the, I mean, you have people selling uh, the the dr the favorite drugs in that area because that's close to the village in mm -hmm. Manhattan. Greenwich Village. So the drug back then was the heroin. Right, and, right, right. And the pills and all that shit. So you got people doing like three, four blacks lines, waiting just to get you know, mm -hmm. fuck shit uh, on the veins, you know. Right, right. So uh, and then and then they, they then it came to the crack era. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So, I never sold crack. I never liked my business. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when I saw the heroin business, and uh, it was, I was like, wow. And uh, as a matter of fact, I had a friend of mine in the Lower East Side who used to make a uh, hundred thousand dollars a day. Wow. How old do you think he was? I don't know. This is going on. How old? He was sixteen years old. Hundred thousand dollars a day. Yeah, Ricky, Ricky Melendez. He's on the. He's on. He's on you. He's on. Um, he's on uh, Google. Wow. Okay. Guy was grand. making all that money. He had grand. a crew. Wow. He had a crew of guys mm -hmm. who will kill you in a heartbeat, no problem. I was gonna say you need mercenaries around you if you're making that kind of money. <laughs> but the thing is, though, uh, no, no, but no, this is interesting because you talk about someone who's 16 years old. Has a has an empire that's making a million dollars every ten days, right? Okay, a million dollars yeah. every ten days. So that's what three hundred three hundred million. It's about that big. What 30, sorry, thirty million thirty million dollars a year, and then some, maybe thirty six million dollars. Well, they don't last. They don't last long. They what? they'll they'll last like what a couple of years, three years, then they get arrested. Okay. But the feds get on them right away. So they get so so this, all right. Okay. So let's let's talk about the glory. The, right. This this kid, sixteen years old, hundred grand a day. How the how the hell does he how does he not get overthrown by his own crew because he's sixteen years old? Well, he's got he this kid like like him. Mm -hmm. Like I was streetwise always. Yeah. But he was more streetwise because mm -hmm. I came from a good parent. I came from a, my father's a teacher, right? Good guy. Mm -hmm. Never fucking don't, don't. I don't think my father ever sold drugs in his life. Like see it physically right. see drugs in his life. Uh, hold on a minute. Yep. No, 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 no. Te vas. No, no, Tranquilo. Okay. Anyway, um. Uh, you know, I come from a good, you know, good, a good family, you know, uh, uh, characteristic. Mm -hmm. The thing is that, but this kid I'm talking about, he come from a, from from a, from a family that they fucking drug users, you know. Right. He he's really really from the streets, and he's a, since he's a kid. And he was he in the life. That. 
Right. Yeah, he earned that. He earned that. He earned respect. He earned that 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 position. Yeah. You know? He got shot a couple of times. He uh mm-hmm. he shot people. He's fucking he fought hard for that. Right. And um I was surprised he didn't have uh, any drug habit. Like myself, I never had any drug habit. Right. Except right. drinking. I drink like crazy. So. <laughs> but the thing is that uh uh he, you know, he learned the hard way from the industry, and uh, he had a nice little crew of crew of uh, friends, mm-hmm. and they very uh, faithful to him. Right. And uh, well, he, I remember his his man hitman was named his name was Savage. Right. And Savage will kill anybody like for nothing, just for nothing. Well, you don't get that you know? nickname for no reason, right? Exactly. And Savage is. I mean, I think he died in jail. He died of AIDS because. He was also a porno star. He was, right. you know, Into doing porno before. He worked for men. So. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing is that these are the people that I'm around all, all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and um, like him, I met a lot of other people. All right. Remember the movie Carlitos Way? Yes. Yes. Okay. His real name is not Carlitos. His real name is Jose. Okay. And he's Puerto Rican. Mm-hmm. And I know the real guy. Okay. He's from the Lower East Side. Okay. So... Well, the thing is that that's how I become, you know, a drug dealer. Then uh, after that, I, 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 I have to do some crazy thing in the lower side. I have to leave the lower side. I'm going to go into detail. But I, right, I, I got trouble in the lower side. Okay. So I took off mm-hmm. and I went to East New York. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's where I met Mike. But uh, before I met Mike, I made a lot of money. And uh, I met Mike. I met Mike like at the end of my era. To be to be uh, realistic, you know? <laughs> I, I met a few cops way before I met Mike because I knew a cop from um, from the Lower East Side. Mm-hmm. I, I knew cops from Washington Heights, right. but uh, you know, when I went to East New York, that's when I met Mike, and we started doing business. So, you know, I mean, um, with um, <clears throat> excuse me, with regard to like from what I remember from the documentary was. Um, that you and Mike kind of became acquainted through an intermediary who ran a car dealership or ran a car, um, sorry, he ran a car modification business. He installed high-end music, right? Well, he, in all reality, Mike put his eyes on me way before that. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. He used to come to my store, Mm -hmm. right? And, uh, by, you know, because I, I, when I, I remember, I started opening up my store 24 7. Right. And uh, when I started the night shift, that I, that I had a couple of guys working at nighttime, uh, he used to come at night and uh, purchase bread, pampers, soda, sometimes a couple of beers, a pack of beers, whatever. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then, uh, like a couple of nights a week, I used to stay, stick around, like into what, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, just to check things out. Mm-hmm. And uh, one at one of the time, I saw Mike, and uh, I like his attitude. I like his his, his uh, personality. He came in, so a couple of times I told him, I told the guy in the, behind the counter, "Don't charge him." So, uh, so Mike was like, you know, hello. I said, "Don't." You? I told Mike, "You don't have to pay." Okay. You know, because I understand you patrol the area, and we all alone here in this corner, and and. All right, so then he kept coming every week, and then then, then I opened up a, a video store. Remember back then the VHS? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we used to, I, I put a business to rent all okay. the videos, right? So it was too high class for that area. Gotcha. gotcha. It was really fucking modern, really nice, you know? And the thing is that uh, when I did that, he came over and he asked me, he says, uh, uh, Adam, uh, don't you think this uh, this video store is like too 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 much of a high class for this area? And I said, no, why not? I want to give my community, uh, you know, a good you know quality. Bring them up. Yeah. It's like, all right, okay. He was like, all right, I'll buy that. Anyway, well, he didn't know because he didn't know my operation. Yeah. You know, uh, he didn't know is that from the grocery store which was in the corner, 
the basements were connected. Uh, right. So what I used to do is, I have a whole fucking stash right here, mm -hmm. and then I have guys working for me here, and would we'll give these guys that would come from the bottom of the basement, grab the stuff, and bring it all along to mm -hmm. the store. Right. You know what I mean? So in case the police raided my place, mm -hmm. they could fucking look all day long in the store. They were not gonna find shit. So, so you know what I mean? It would, yeah, yeah. So it, it was designed as a, as as almost like a product protection, so to speak. Yeah, but not only that, I changed that all the time because I also had apartment upstairs. The building, it was my building. The whole right. building was mine. Right, so, right, right. Because that's so I mean. It's, I mean that's the thing. I mean, you know, I can imagine that you know it's not exactly a, a community-based enterprise. Do you know what I mean? You know, you, you got you got guys looking at you, wanting what you got. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like you know what what you you know what are you gonna do? I mean, like, cause the the documentary and, and forgive me if I'm talking out of line here. It also mentions uh, La Compania as well. You know, and I know that that gets on you. Know, I know that upsets you, and I do apologize. <laughs> It's all right. It's all right. It doesn't upset me. It's okay. Is that well? The guy, the guy who owns a compañía, he he was not my friend, mm -hmm. but he was someone I know. Right. And he was a good guy. Mm -hmm. He was a cold-hearted killer. Mm -hmm. He was a friend of mine, mm -hmm. and uh, and I dated his sister, and you know, and uh, but the guy was cool. Uh, the guy had a, a rough life all his life. Right. Before, before he went to New York City and lived there, he spent like fucking nine years in jail in this country. Ooh, okay. uh, you know, he spent nine years doing time in jail, and and it's not easy to do time in this country. Right. You know, so and uh, so he went over there, and, but but he ended up fucking somebody I know, mm -hmm. he, because a compañía was not his business. Okay. It was a friend of mine called Miguel Pons. And uh, and uh, Miguel Pons was a millionaire already, so he left Cello, who's mm -hmm. the owner of La Compañía. He left Cello there to take care of the business and told the guy, all right, Cello, I'm going back to the Dominican Republic. When, uh, send me every week my share. That's all I want. Mm -hmm. So Cello did it like for eight months. Okay. No, After good that, idea. He, wanted, he wanted to be a smart guy, don't send money. Oh. Yeah. I, so the the guy I know, Miguel, came back and you know put pressure on Cello. What Cello did, he made another big mistake. He attempted to kill the guy, but he wasn't successful. Oh, oh dear, that's that's no good, no good. So Cello ends up getting killed. Well, you know, you you, you play with matches, right? You're gonna get burned. <laughs> Like... I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for him. I'm sorry for his family. But, but he did try to kill the other guy. So you know. But that was all, the... is, all he has to do is be honest and, and send the guy his money because it's not your business to, to begin with. It's the other guy's business. Well, and, but... and, that, and and Cello was kind of the introduction to you and Mike because from the from what I've from what I heard from the documentary was the fact that. Mike originally wanted to do a sit down with Cello and say, hey, you know what? For X amount, we'll protect your shit. Well, I, I don't know if I could say that uh, because uh, Mike knew me before Cello, but didn't mm -hmm. know me in business. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, the thing is that um, what made Mike uh, 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 got in contact with me to, to meet him and everything was because uh, my friend Baron Perez, mm -hmm. the guy who got his face covered up in the documentary, yeah, yeah. Baron, uh, he knew I was straight up dude, you know? So he says to me, Adam, um, uh, this guy, friend of mine, Mike, wants to meet you, pa 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 pa. I mean, I knew the patrol guy, but I didn't know his name was Mike. Gotcha. He never gave me his name. And uh, so um, I said, all right, let me talk to him because I, I didn't trust Mike. I didn't trust the other guy, but I trust Baron. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I talked to Baron and then Baron mm -hmm. 
says, uh, all right, we set up a date, we got together, we started talking, and, um, you know, he liked me from the get. He's like, oh, remember me? I said, yeah, I remember you. So we started talking, and then we set up our prices, you know, and we started doing business. So, so I mean, if you, I mean, if you had kind of like thinking, oh, man, I don't know about this, you know, and, and he comes to you and says, hey, uh, I want 25 grand for a sit down. I want 25 grand for a meet. What makes you kind of say, okay, let's, 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 let's talk. What do you mean? $25,000? Yeah. You remember he said, he said that he wanted 25 grand for a sit down, right? In the documentary. Yeah. yeah? Just as an introduction. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't mind. I had the money, no problem. Uh -huh. But you did, but, but you were like, you, you kind of felt confident to say that this guy, you know, he's not going to shake me down. He's not going to, you know, he's not going to fuck with me in any way, shape or form. Well, he didn't know my operation. Right. He, I mean, well, he knew everybody, like the, the FBI knew. Mm -hmm. like, he just... The, his only job was to give me a call if they're going to shake me down. Mm -hmm. But I mean, actually, the FBI knew I had a spot. The mm -hmm. FBI knew everything. But remember, it was all law. The new law came in 1980, uh, 1987. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, you know, the feds were not into drug dealers, really, unless you were real, like, really major, 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 like gotcha. Escobar size, you know. Uh -huh. So, uh, only the state of New York was after drug dealers. I see, I see. You know what I mean? So the FBI knew about me, the state knew about me, but there were so many fucking spots and I was doing it so cool, they uh -huh. were not going to come after me like that. So. Because they did came after me a couple of times, but they were not successful. So, I mean, so, I mean playing it cool, I can I, I mean, I can imagine, like, I, I mean, me, I, I, I don't even know what it must be like to kind of be thinking, I got cops around the corner. I got feds looking at me. I got other crews wanting to probably try and jack my shit. Like, how did how how do you maintain that kind of smooth? As you say, moving it smooth. You know, that cool composure. Well, how how what what was that? Was what was the psychology there? I well, you you have to be. Like if you compare my organization to the to the uh, La Cosa Nostra organization, right? Mm -hmm. You could see that the guy before John Gotti, mm -hmm. what was his name? Uh, um, I forgot his name. The old guy who got killed by John Gotti. Uh, he was smooth. He didn't like violence. He didn't like. Uh, he don't. He wouldn't bring uh, expensive suits with him or anything like that mm -hmm. and that's what keeps you in business you can't make a lot of noise no heat so that's exactly what i was doing right in this new york uh if 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 i see anybody in my area shooting making noise uh it's going to bring my attention mm -hmm. because that's going to make my area hot it's going to it's going to bring the police attention yeah so what i did was uh, like if anybody in the area, like usually dope heads do that. They make a lot of fucking noise over little pennies. I mean, they, they shoot somebody for nothing. Right, right. So what I did was, I, you know, I call up, up on, on a reunion. Uh, like one time this guy was giving me a hard time. He put a spot like four blocks away from my spot. And he was making a lot of noise. So I called the guy up and I said, his name was Franklin. You know, at, yep. at the end he got yep. killed. And I said, Franklin, look, sit down. Let's talk. So he's like, wow, wow. I said, listen. How much money are you making? I'm gonna give you a grocery store. I'm gonna give you another spot. I'm gonna give you money and get the fuck out of here. Mm -hmm. I don't want you in my area. You're making a lot of noise, and that's bringing a lot of police attention. I don't want that. So he agreed. He got his money. He left. Mm -hmm. I mean, he gave me trouble later on because uh, he got involved with a with a family of mine, a first cousin of mine, and then he tried to kill my first cousin, and that that's when I had to. You know, step in. Really consider to to come after him. Mm -hmm. but he, but he, I mean, when when they come in after your family, that changes the whole. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it changes it, the dynamic. Changes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so, I mean, 
so you you now like you kind of you've already made like you've now made Mike's acquaintance. You've had the sit down, but Mike comes as a package deal, right? You know, he's got a partner, Mr. Kenny Urell. Okay, now I don't want to give too much of the documentary away, but spoiler alert: things go down. Yeah. <laughs> So you said that in the beginning that you like Mike. You said, you know what? Yeah, you know he was a guy. I, you know, I didn't trust him completely at first, but this was a guy who built my trust. Um, when, when, when it became Mike and Kenny, what was that relationship like? What was how how was that? Because you know, obviously now you were used, you were used to seeing Mike, and now you got Mike and Kenny. What was that like? Well, as you know, patrol cars back then, they had their business, uh, their, their partners, mm -hmm. you know, driving around. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, uh, when Mike came to, to Baron's place to meet me, he came with Kenny. Right. Okay. You know? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, like, uh, not that I didn't like, I didn't trust Kenny's, uh, Kenny's uh, look. Uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, by the way, they keep calling Kenny a rat. Right. And I don't agree. You don't agree? Oh, no, I oh, agree. oh. I we got an exclusive. Right. Talk to me. What, what, no, what? I, think, I think Kenny was always a cop. That's all. Right. He was a cop. What do cops do? They put people in jail. That's what they do. Well, you think that Kenny was deep cover? He's, he was still a fucking cop. Right. And who knows? The FBI got so many ways of working that mm -hmm. uh, systems that uh, I don't know I, but I never trust mm -hmm. Kenny like that okay I think he was always a cop and uh but you could say that he betrayed Mike yeah mm -hmm. I, I give that to Mike right he did betray Mike but I don't feel that Kenny betrayed me because Kenny was a cop to me he was right. a cop so uh, I expected and I got what I what I was expecting Right, 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 right. You know what I mean? So, so um, would you would you have said that the most of the business aspect of things was conducted with you and Mike? Like you and Mike would have the talk, or was did would, would, did did you know was Kenny ever involved in any of the kind of business? I only saw Kenny the first time. That was it. That was it. After that, Kenny came a couple of times with Mike in the car, but we didn't cross words. All I talked, the only guy I talked to was Mike. Right, right, right. And um, but yeah, I they had Chicky in my in my uh, in one of my spots working for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chicky. Um, <laughs> I did trust Chicky. Chicky was someone you could trust. Uh, uh, what's the name? Uh, the big guy. Uh, Walter. Uh, huh? Walter. Walter. Yeah, Walter. I love Walter. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't talk much. Uh -huh. But he was a guy of, of action. I was gonna say I don't think he needed to talk much. I, you know, he was just like. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Fucking Walter was the, the, the guy who, uh, you could, when you have Walter behind you, trust me, you, you got to back up. Well, that was the thing. When I saw the size of him back in the day, I was like, my God, this guy's like a quarterback. He's, he's huge. Well, well, it's not, it's not. Look, I mean, I was in a business where the size didn't matter right. much. Uh -huh. uh, well, yeah, you so, Dominicans aren't exactly kind of the tallest. No, species. we all small. We all small. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, but uh, Walter, like, like I seen guys in jail, mm -hmm. little guys knocking down big guys. Yeah, yeah. One hit, okay. In the street, I see big guys crying like babies. Okay, now. Uh, Walter had it both. Walter had the size and he had the balls. Right. So, you know, he had it all there together. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, Mike got balls too, but... Um, but <laughs> he certainly he, does. He, like, was the whole crew was, was good. The whole crew, Mike got, was, was really cool. Uh, so, I, you know, you, got, you guys were, you know, kind of... Um, you kind of form this this bond, if you will. Do you know what I mean? You know, like they 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 dub Mike a gangster with a badge. Yeah. Would you say that's a fair a fair a fair description, or do you think that 
you know, Mike was a guy who seized on an opportunity? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, I think Mike, like me, came from a good family, but he, he ends up, you know, going around, you know, uh, what, what you call it, that, that would have been a great life for him. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he ends up in trouble like myself. And uh, by the way, I, you know, uh, I did this documentary and, um, and that was my life. But I'm a grown man mm-hmm. uh, and I understand that drugs is not the right way to go. Right. Uh, not because it's not good to use drugs or anything like that, because anything is bad. Like you drink coffee, you can get far. You drink a lot of sugar, you can get far. You drink a lot of alcohol, you get all kinds of shit. Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. everything, who knows what's good, what's bad. Right. Right. It's, everything is a way of life. That's how I understand it. True. True. But yeah. drugs, drugs are not good because it's illegal. Yeah. Boy. I mean- I mean that brings us on to an, an interesting subject. I mean, like you know, you yeah. were, you were you were knee deep in in this new war on drugs, right? Okay, back in the day, Nixon declared, right? We need we need a we need a hard stance on drugs. We need a hard stance on marijuana. We need a hard stance. The irony is, he was he was taking a really large stance on on um, on drugs that. Um, alienated particular communities which i which i find just completely crazy do you know what i mean because you know there was the big hippie movement back in the day and um and and marijuana um obviously you know they said oh yeah so what do we do well let's alienate you know we can't we can't make it illegal for you to be a hippie we can't make it illegal for you to be uh latino or black or mexican or whatever yeah but what we can do is we can make it illegal for what you ascribe to your culture be it marijuana lsd whatever it is and that breeds the war that you were involved in back in the day yes like it's like a it was like a culture yeah you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like right now in New York City, we have, we have a huge problem. And I say we have because I have three kids in New York City. Right. And I have all my brothers, all my sisters in New York and all over the states. Mm-hmm. I mean, like any like any New York uh, citizen or United States citizen, yeah. uh, I have people in my family that are in, in the military. Mm-hmm. I have, uh, you know, a first cousin of mine died in the World Trade Center. Oh man, sorry to hear that. Yeah, to DPS, and uh, uh, you know, like like any citizen out there, I feel the pain. So, mm-hmm. uh, right now we have a huge problem with with a heroin and uh, habit up there. Right. You know, it's a lot of heroin in the street. A lot of a lot of kids are using heroin. So, you know, I I strongly believe that because it didn't work with me and it didn't work with with a lot of parents. Uh, you know, uh, harsh sentencing is not going to help at mm. all. Mm. You know what I mean? Well, I mean... The only thing that can help get get rid of drugs or, or shit like that, that kind of behavior, is education. That's it. Yeah. Nothing else. Well, I mean, for me, it's always been a thing whereby... I live in a borough in London whereby heroin is quite prolific. Um, and uh, for I, I see I, I I've, I'm a I'm, how do I say it like I'm, I'm a kind of a new age hippie type kind of thing do you know what I mean it's like I believe <laughs> I, that, I, I, I believe that you know that there are um, the, the the benefits with regards to things like marijuana with um, the the psychological benefits to um, psilocybin mushrooms all of that kind of stuff you know but ultimately, what I don't believe in is this this war on on drugs that is number one incarcerating people for yeah. because let, I mean let's look at it like this right okay a majority of people who get caught up using drugs you know whether it be heroin cocaine crack whatever 
all right generally nine times out of ten there is trauma there's trauma behind it because people want to get away from what they're feeling yeah all right yeah. those negative feelings but what no one's addressing and what no one's talking about is the biggest legal gateway drug which is alcohol exactly exactly right? you did I feel the same way I feel the same way in my country here in the Dominican Republic uh, you allowed to drink while you're driving <laughs> what is it for real yeah, it's a culture you get in the car you put a beer next to you you drink and you drive Damn. I mean if you're drunk and the cops stop you uh, he probably gonna give you a hard time you give him a couple of dollars you keep going but the thing is that like you said uh, commercials in the, in the t on TV, mm -hmm. fucking on the radio station. Mm -hmm. Like, if you drink Presidente, you'll be the man. <laughs> Your fucking seven-year-old kid is listening to this shit. Yeah. You know what? It's like, duh, you know, meanwhile, you want to get rid of marijuana. Mm -hmm. Marijuana doesn't get you as fucked up as alcohol. No, no, not I at mean, all. Honest, honestly. I mean, well, I mean, I mean, look at it like this, all right, okay? Some of the most creative people have attributed things like marijuana, LSD, to their art. Steve Jobs credits LSD for giving him the inspiration to to do what he did. Do you, exactly. know, you know, so why is it that we're not having a conversation about that and the, and the cognitive benefits? And the medical, the medical benefits to, to marijuana. I mean, well, I mean, we, we kind of are. I think the guard is starting to change a little bit because if you look at things like, the, like California, the medical marijuana, Colorado, um, who, you know, Colorado now is having a, a tax surplus, I hear, because people are just buying it hand over fist. To the point yeah. where they're actually giving citizens of Colorado money back on their taxes because there's there's too much money. There's too much money coming in. And it's more money than they've <laughs> ever made from alcohol. Exactly. So. Well, like I say, you know, uh, harsh sentence and all that shit that they did in the States from the 80s all the way into now, mm -hmm. it's not, it didn't help. It only affected communities, affected families. Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't raise, I'm going to be very honest, I learned my lesson, but uh, if they would have just gave me one year sentence, we don't do, we don't do respect to, uh, you know, the state's law, federal laws, mm -hmm. but if they would have given me a year sentence and, and made me go to the school that year in, in there mm -hmm. or, and, 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 uh, and work on my education more than, than try to punish me, Mm -hmm. Most probably would have never sold drugs ever again. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like, uh, but they don't do that. Like, you spend 10, 20, 25 years in there. When you come out, you come out worse. Well, you can. Well, yeah, you become institutionalized by, you know, by the system. I mean, but can you imagine, though, if, they, you know, in some kind of utopian world <laughs> where they did say, hey, you know what, we're going to educate you. Could you imagine them having, uh, could you imagine the system having... A whole bunch of educated Hispanic and black former prisoners that would be so educated to the point they don't want to educate that's the thing that's that's my point they don't want to educate they want to keep minorities in the trap exactly you know it's like you, if you get two hungry mice and you feed them cheese and then you take the cheese away, they're going to eat each other, bottom line, right? There's, yeah. there, there's going to come a point. And that is exactly where I think that this, this is, this is a, a <laughs> we, we could really go off on a tangent here and start talking about, you know, political conspiracy or whatever. But my point is that they don't want social cohesion because w war, whether it be international, social, economic, it breeds money. It makes money because you've now got private prisons in the States whereby they're paid per head per year for, you know, like the, there was a there was a judge who was indicted for sending young people to prison uh, because they, they found out that he was on the take that he would, you know. So what makes 
what you were doing any different from what that guy was doing? It's just the fact that your product was different. Yeah. Well, look, the the states, the federal state laws, they uh, they make. Uh, I heard the other day on the news on on CNN. They say that there were like two point three million people incarcerated in the states. Mm -hmm. I saw fucking bullshit. It's got to be more than nine million people in jail right now. The reason is because they make, according to the books. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not me doing the math. They mm -hmm. doing the math. Yep. They make 13.8 million arrests a year. 13.8 million arrests a year. 75% mm -hmm. of those arrests are violent crime. You do the math. Do the math. Absolutely. Don't tell me you got 2.3 million people in jail. You got to have at least 9 million people in jail. Well, CNN uh, isn't exactly somewhere that you go for the, for, for, for the hard... <laughs> the hard statistics, right? <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm always reading. And uh, look, um, that book that says that do not, do not even count the people that are on pretrial, people that are not being sentenced yet. Yeah, remand, yeah, yeah. But, but if you do the math and you check how many county jails, how many uh, temporary uh, uh uh, stations full of inmates, mm -hmm. and we're talking 2,000, 1,500 inmates at a time. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to Pennsylvania, and, and most of the working population there is like Marines, uh, ex Marines, fucking ex cops, uh, working uh, uh, as a uh, security guard for a prison, for a local prison. Wow, okay. Like Lewisburg, 5,000 fucking inmates, right? Mm -hmm. So, most of the working population in Pennsylvania belongs to the prison population. So what are you doing? I mean, I, I asked the states, what are you doing? You incarcerating people as a, what? As a human factory to give some of your citizens some jobs? I don't think that fucking make any fucking sense. No, 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 absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, and they, and they say that, they say that in public. They say, oh, we're building prison and when we build this prison in this state, Oh, I say Buffalo. Uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna secure jobs for ten thousand. Say what the fuck? So what? You're gonna incarcerate fucking a million people so you can get ten thousand of uh, guys uh, jobs? <laughs> wow! What a fucking genius you are. No, it, there's something definitely so, wrong there. So you go to the Bronx and you grab a, a 15 year old kid, a 16 year old kid, a 17 year old kid because he was selling drugs in the corner. But there's nothing to do in that community. Mm. There's nothing to do there. So they grab that kid. They give this kid 10 years for, for selling an ounce of coke. Mm -hmm. Right? Fucking secure your borders. Don't let the fucking drug comes in so the kid don't ever get the drugs in the head, you know? And then and then you're gonna give this kid 10 years and send him what? To Lewisburg. 10, 10 years later, he comes out. What do you think you're gonna get? So, uh, I, I mean, that's another interesting point that you bring, you know, about securing the borders. I mean, you know, you've got someone like Donald Trump saying, oh, we're going to build a higher wall and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. I mean, like, you know, if, if, there, there's, you know, you know you people know, know I, how I, to get stuff in, you know? You know, it, you know, I'm Spanish, mm -hmm. right? But you're not going to believe I agree with Donald Trump in a lot of things. I do. I oh. certainly do. Okay. All right. Let's. let's you know, because, uh, like a lot of Spanish people come to the to the states for a better life. Mm -hmm. A lot of Mexicans, a lot of Dominicans, a lot of Brazilian. But there's a, there's also a lot of people that come. Like, look, I never, I never, I didn't learn how to sell drugs in Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I learned how to sell drugs in the states. Right. I didn't choose to come to the United States. They bring me to the United States. And I love the United States. I do love them. I don't mm -hmm. care if they gave me 10, 20 years, whatever. Mm -hmm. I did what I did. They got their laws and I got punished. Simple as that. Uh, you know, and I had to uh, accept it. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't learn how to sell drugs in, this, uh, in Dominican Republic. I learned it over there. Now, but there is a lot of people 
and I know it's a fact because I did time in jail. I did a lot of time. I did 17 years altogether. Wow. And 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 to be honest with you, being a, a, a states lover like I am, I love the states. And, and, and you know, that's where I met my first love, my sweetheart, my high school sweetheart. That's where I learned how to ride a bike. That's where I learned how to drive a car where I got my first license and mm -hmm. so and so. So, and then when I see a guy who come all the way from Colombia or from Brazil or from Mexico, mm -hmm. and, and he's already a grown man, mm -hmm. and the only, only, only reason that he came to the state was to become a millionaire, make money off drugs, to bring it back to his country. Don't right. like that picture. Right. Don't, that's not good. I did it because it was like a culture to me. But mm -hmm. then after I got old enough to understand the facts, I say, oh, no, no good. But do you, do you think that like maybe Trump is just kind of painting this very broad picture of Mexico that, I mean, we know that there's a big problem with the cartels in Mexico. We know that. I mean, I know that. I live in the UK and I know that Mexico's got a problem. But you said that there is a portion of hardworking people who want to kind of to do better, you know, to kind of do better for themselves, do better for their families, whatever the motivation is. Do you not think that, you know, that Trump using such sensational language is, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm being, I'm being as kind of, you know, but he, he is being rather sensational. Do you like, you know, saying, oh, all Mexicans are, are drug dealers and da, 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 and all of this kind of stuff. Nah, you know? nah, he's totally wrong. He's totally wrong. But I agree with him in a lot of things. Right. You know, like you can't have a border out of control. You can't. You have to have control. You have to. You just have to. It's a question of how you that. apply that control, though, isn't it? He has to, you have to have control of your immigration. Like, like here in the Dominican Republic, we have the problems with, with the Haitians in the border. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, you need to understand that the Dominican Republic is a poor country. It's not, it's not a rich country like the states. But it's resource-rich. It's resource-rich. It's, it's got right. resources. You guys have got resources. This is a yes. Thing. Financially, you, to, you might not be there, that. but you've got I, resource. It, listen, the states, the United States government control that. Every time I see the Dominican flag, and everybody's like patriotic, and blah, blah, I say, come on. You know, it's not about that. The right. Corporations control the whole world. Yes. The government's just a fucking cop you're using the, the, the big guns to control this shit. Indeed. That don't mean shit to me. <laughs> the heart of the people means something to me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's a proud so, people. Exactly. So, um, like I told a friend of mine a long time ago, I wish I was born when uh, Simon Bolivar uh, era. All right. I'm probably going to go fight. <laughs> uh, I love, I love definitely Fidel Castro. I love this guy. Uh -huh. So, you know, um, the thing is that we have a border, and this country is too poor to grab so many immigrants from Haiti, uh, you know, and, and be part of our workforce. Mm -hmm. You can have a certain amount of them, but not not like it's too much. It's right. too much people. Like it's too much for this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, if only the whole world can come together and say, you know what, in Latin America, this is the the poorest country. Uh, Haiti. So let's get all together and help this country develop, right? Right. But look, they don't even have a fucking forest. They don't have trees up there. Everything is burning because they use everything to make carbon. It's like fucking unbelievable. Right. So you know the age is killing everybody up there too. So uh, you know Dominican Republic doesn't have the resource to uh, at least help. We help as much as we can, but mm -hmm. not you know. So I say the same thing about, about the states. You know what I mean? The United States takes a lot of immigrants from all over the world, from Russia, from uh, U all over Europe, all over you know, Latin America. And, and you know, a Mexican, uh, Mexico happened to be, uh, to have a, a border with the states, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, they should have control. Yeah, they should. I, I agree with, with Donald Trump about that. I don't agree that everybody, that everyone that comes to the states, they drug dealers and they uh, killers and all of this shit, you know, because, I mean, you don't want to see the Russians, all the Russians in the states, because they, they are the fucking, they are the, the people with the balls, trust me. 
Well, yeah, I mean, Vladimir Putin going over to Syria and saying, hey, we're going to knock you out, bye-bye, you know, so... You, pre you prefer to have Mexicans than the Russians all the way, because the Russians don't, they're not scared. They're not troublemakers, but if you come and fuck with them... You, I mean, they're going to finish the job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Adam, I, we've, you know what, we've gone over an hour already. That, that's how quick, that's how quick it's gone, man. It's like, dude... It's, it's you're it's so easy to talk to you do you know what i mean you know i i mean i don't even think that we've covered half of the stuff that i wanted to cover i mean um okay i mean if you if you've got the time i would love love you to come back on the show would you be more would you be happy to do that sure sure why not i like it that's nice um you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be around. I'm still gonna be around. My man, my man. So listen, let's plug the cigars. The seven five cigars. They come uh, in what? How, how, there's three different varieties. Is that right? Yeah. You got the Cabriolet. You got the New Lads, and you have the Big Boss. The Big Boss. You know, I, I like the uh, out of the three. I love uh, the the New Lads. Mm -hmm. Is is kind of soft. It's, you know, so. Uh, Good taste, you know. Uh, Tabacalera Parma is making this cigar for me right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're gonna uh, do it. Uh, we don't. We don't have a huge contract, uh, long distance, you know, long time contract mm -hmm. with them. But uh, I think they the best in the country. Right, right, right. That's and the guy who owns the 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 the, the, the Tabacalera, you know, he's a good friend of mine. Cool. And um, uh, you know. I, I feel I feel bad for the New York Post uh, bringing up that that, that article because um, first of all I don't touch this cigar. This cigars I made by Tabacalera Parma, mm -hmm. and they send it straight from the fabric to the states. Right. It's called Zona Franca. Zona Franca means like free land. Gotcha. Like uh, nobody touches those cigars. I don't even fucking come around them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, if I want some, I call them and they send it to me. Okay. I don't fucking go there at all because you're not allowed to go in that area. Gotcha, gotcha. It's like, it's like you could say it's controlled by the United States. That's uh -huh. what I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, hear I hear you, brother. I hear you. That's like a, that's like a, that's like a, like a, the Ford company in, uh, or, or IBM in fucking Mexico or Brazil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know absolutely. what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. They make the computers, they make the cars, and they send it straight to That's the state. That's out. That's it's it. Out. That's it. So, I mean, how do people get hold of the seven five cigar? What's where's the best place to go for that? Okay, right now Michael Dow is controlling that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm working on. Uh, I'm working uh, with a major distributor. Uh, distributor. Uh, to make it happen worldwide and to make it happen uh, so the customers can get it in hand mm -hmm. faster, but uh, it's gonna take a little time. Okay. Uh, I was just I was just doing a test, like a trial. Yeah. To see how things work, and Mike has been doing a good job. But Mike is kind of is is busy all the time. This mm -hmm. guy's always uh, doing uh, hosting a show. Uh, Hollywood's after him, and so. Uh, I just wanted to do a trial, and, and it worked out. But uh, I'm, work, I'm, I'm trying to work some uh, a good deal with a distribution uh, um, uh, company that's going to make it available for everyone. Fantastic! That's awesome. And that's going to be very very soon. So. Wow! You know, don't forget your friends. You know. <laughs> I will send you. I will. I promise you. I'll send you a box with my signature on. Okay. Ah, oh, you're the man. I love you, Adam. I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. Um, what I'll do is I will put um, Mike. I'll get in touch with Mike, and I'll get the details from him where to go for the cigars. Um, and yeah, and if the, you know, if you're in the US, it shouldn't be that tricky. So um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a done deal. So um, I'll promote that on my website, and um, and we'll you know we'll we'll move the seven five worldwide <laughs> I thank you so much oh, Amen, Adam it was an absolute pleasure and I look forward to talking to you again brother okay I I'll All be right. available for you okay thanks, buddy man. thanks a lot man love you guy bye take care you're welcome